Greetings, family. This is your boy, Sar Imhotep, with the Madhu Andela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture, and member of the Amara Squad, coming to you this evening on November the 21st, Eastern. Um, today is a Tuesday. Say peace to the family is in the chat room. Um, I have my phone, so I see y'all. Um, excuse me, as you can hear. Chat going on right now. Excuse me, the, the volume. So I had to put it down. So ah, I'm back. And um, well, back also from the Black Power Awards weekend held in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was invited to give a presentation on Friday, November the 17th. And the title of the program, excuse me, the title of the presentation was um, an African-centered critique of a book written by Dr. Wesley Muhammad titled Ra is Allah, Why Asar Imhotep, and that's me, Asar Imhotep, is wrong. Mathematics of a Ma'atic Islam. <clears throat> and so the this discussion topic was not chosen by me. It was, it was, and I prepared a presentation for the topic um, at hand. And so for those of you who were not able to attend the Black Power Awards in Atlanta this year, um, as always, or at least most of the time when um, I do a presentation somewhere that's kind of one of a kind, um, I come back of YouTube and I give the presentation for those who were not able to uh, attend. So the presentation time for ours was an hour and a half. So this isn't, you know, one of my shorter presentations. Um, you know, we're going to strap in. Hopefully, we'll be done by probably, you know, probably a full two hours. Sure. So I'm not going to waste time on again for coming in and listening. And um, thank you all for the the support, the the critic uh, and challenges regarding you know this particular topic and i'm gonna you know move forward so i will share my screen foremost shout out to brother Unk, shout out to brother wujawu the priest um for the the hospitality that they gave me when i got to atlanta and a uh, shout out to the uh black dot store and the brain dot and uh, uh, brother Lana said and done. I'm going to put a link to a GoFundMe. Those who want to support as we build and grow this center, a direct link to to support that endeavor. So I'm going to get started. So uh, excuse me during this transition. And if y'all hear any clankety clank clank, that's because I like tea. Ninja Turtles cup, you can still see the steam on our screen, you know, coming out the cups. So I'm in. But um so share screen. Okay. So I'm uh in the chat if screen comes up. Delay, so um, the screen, uh, the 
let me know. My, my live is not on the chat on my, my phone. Someone give me a heads up. See the screen. I'm typing in the chat right now. Testing, testing. Feedback. Just trying to see. Um, delay. So, as mentioned earlier, and, and please excuse my voice if it if it doesn't come out clear. Atlanta, I think due to the weather change, um, Philly uh, to Atlanta. But anyway, so I sound a little different. Anyway, so the title of this presentation is to critique of Rise of Law, why Asar and Hotep, that is me, um, is wrong and the problematics of a myotic Islam. The abstract of what I submitted for the uh, presentation, so I'll just read it real quick. Uh, this presentation will be conducted in two parts. The first part of the presentation is a critical assessment of the recent publication, Ra is a Lot, Why Sartre and Hotep is Wrong, 2017, written by Dr. Wesley Muhammad. In this text, Muhammad asserts that the ancient Egyptian deity Ra, linguistically and conceptually, is cognate with the Proto-Semitic Al, in Arabic Allah, God. This is a modified position from his initial claim that Ra was an Egyptianization Allah in his publication, Black Arabia in the African Origin of Islam. From here, we take a closer look at both texts and assess the merits of Muhammad's claims against the available evidence to highlight the strengths and weaknesses of his arguments. I intend to show that despite his claim, this work doesn't live up to the expectations and falls short of providing the necessary evidence to validate his hypotheses. Precursor to a formal written response titled, a lesson in a scientific method, the case of Allah, which is forthcoming. Our secondary focus is to introduce the theory of Afrocentricity as a literary critique instrument and as a framework by which to judge a phenomenon's value. We will utilize the precepts of Afro Afrocentricity to analyze the theoretical construct called Ma'atic Islam as proposed by Professor Muhammad. Ma'atic Islam professes to be a synthesis of Egyptian Ma'at conceptually, and the Arabic religious tradition of Islam. But are these two things compatible? I argue here that there is a fundamental conflict between the two paradigms that are irreconcilable because they are grounded in two opposing frameworks and goals. So as I stated, this is Dr. Wesley Muhammad. This is a screenshot from his um his time at the black excuse me the the breakfast club and i've already done um a presentation critiquing some comments that he made concerning the relevance and utilization of a black studies degree uh as it regards nation building so you can find that on my youtube channel <coughs> excuse me To give some background on this conversation that is going on, as I mentioned in the abstract, in 2009, Dr. Wesley Muhammad wrote a text called Black Arabia and the African Origin of Islam. And in that text, he made a claim that the deity Ra was an import from Arabia by some black Semites and the pronunciation of Ra is an Egyptianization of a Semitic Al, or you know, where we get or L, like in um in the Hebrew tradition, L. There's a glottal stop in the front that's kind of hard to pronounce if you're not used to 
pronouncing glottal stops, but most people just say L or R um, and like an Akkadian Elu, uh, but which is normally pronounced, uh, colloquially pronounced Allah in the uh, Arabic language. And so um, when I assessed his, his claims and looked at his sources and the evidence in which he provided in the book, I was not convinced of his argument. And so in 2013, I released a text called Aluja, Rescue, Reinterpretation, and the Restoration of Major Ancient Egyptian Themes, Volume 1. And chapters to specific questions of his claims in Black Arabia and the African origin of Islam. Um, Actually, at least one of the articles or chapters in there was written prior to, I just put it in book form. <clears throat> so, um, and so not too long after that, um, Dr. Wesley wrote a series of articles in response to my chapters in Aluja. Um, the third article, I can't remember or if he wrote it down somewhere or if he said this like in a presentation somewhere that he was going to write three articles so i was waiting on a third article um he was to write uh and i may be mistaken but um ultimately what he wrote ended up being um compacted and released uh, or compiled and released as the book Ra is Allah, why Asar Imhotep is wrong that we see right here on the right hand side. And this came out in um, February of 2017, um, to my knowledge. So um, again, the topic that was discussed is uh, for the presentation was chosen. I am planning uh, or I'm, I have written or writing a formal response that is gonna be released in Aluja volume two in 2018. Um, his chapter is pretty much done. I'm not gonna do a whole book on him, uh, primarily because I found so many uh, errors and logical fallacies and methodological issues that I would have to write an entire book to address you know, all of the factors in the text. So what I decided to do was to simply uh, do the work that he was supposed to do in Black Arabia and in Ra's Allah and put that together as um, either one long chapter or it'll be broken up into several different chapters. And, um, and so in this response, he has uh, modified his position a bit. And so now, instead of Ra being an import into uh, ancient Egypt and the Egyptianization of, you know, uh, Arabic or, you know, at least a Semitic Allah, um, he argues that they are descendants from a common ancestor and that this word for God uh, are basically different dialectications of each other. And the ancient Egyptians inherited one, one pronunciation, and the Semites inherited another. And so, in, in, which is interesting because in my 2013 work, I made that suggestion. I, I asked the question, how do we know that it was a borrowing? How did we not know that it was not inherited, you know, with the assumption that Semitic languages and ancient Egyptian are related? not closely, but all um, on a genetic level and distantly. And so he takes uh, my suggestion and that becomes his uh, basis for the whole book. However, when making such a claim, there is a process that you must go through uh, linguistically, which he did not do at all. And so it, the, in my opinion, it, it was really kind of a waste of a conversation if he did not do that work. And so it was it was a lot of speculation in the book, a lot of hypotheses, but no demonstration. And for those of you who know, I have a science, a science background and, you know, I've modified Professor Manu M. Pim's saying, you know, Manu M. Pim being a historian, 
he says that documentation beats conversation. Well, me as a scientist, demonstration beats conversation. And so with this being a scientific field and not just simply something of history, there is a scientific method for making, uh, for testing hypotheses and linguistics for which he did not do. And so <clears throat> that's what I tackle. That's what I do in the upcoming text. And there's some surprising results. Ones that reaffirm hypotheses that I had in the Luja volume one and ones that forced me to abandon certain positions that I had in the Luja volume one. So, you know, that is forthcoming. And so what I'm presenting here today is not the full scope. Um, and I'm not even giving you my conclusions, you know, on, on the matter. Uh, so I'll just address a few things and then I will address primarily the concept of Ma'atic Islam, which would be critical to our overall discussion. Because what you'll, what you'll discover in Aluja volume two is that the, the African conceptualization of God is a is very important to this to this discussion. So this is kind of a prerequisite, you know, to uh, that discussion. So um, again, peace to everyone in the chat. Peace to everyone who's listening live who are not in the chat. And and peace to everyone who was listening um, a little later on. <clears throat> so this is this is not the real cover. This is just what I made up in PowerPoint. Um, but this is Aluja volume two, Chiena into science and philosophy. So Chiena into is the label that I am promoting in lieu of the Negro Egyptian as proposed by um, Dr. Theofalo Obinga in 1993. And so, um, so this text is the entire text is going to be focused on the Chiena into language family their conceptualization of science, religion, and philosophy. And so what um, ultimately what I'm gonna demonstrate is that uh, Egyptian philosophy is in fact Bantu philosophy. And so um, not only linguistically, but uh, conceptually, culturally, ancient Egypt belongs to the Bantu world. And so that will be kind of the theme I'll be rolling with in 2018. So I hope you are there for that. So, <clears throat> um, uh, I will skip this part because I did, again, a presentation on the Breakfast Club transcript. Um, but what I want to, you know, highlight again is that, again, our brother, Dr. Wesley Muhammad, has a uh, an issue with, with African-centeredness and Afrocentricity. Coming up here is a transcript or a partial transcript from Dr. Wesley Muhammad's 2011 Savior's Day presentation. And so within 10 minutes, not even up to 10 minutes into the presentation, it says the following. He says, our children are being kidnapped by ideologies other than Islam, gangs, Afrocentricity, or the so-called culture of hip hop. We're losing our children to all of these other ideologies. And so you can, uh, one, well, one wonders, how does Afrocentricity fall into the mix of a, 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 a weapon, so to speak, to where we would be losing our children? Now, he's speaking about Muslim children, more specifically, um, as, as is evidenced by the statement, you know, kidnapped by ideologies other than Islam. So you can see from the get-go that much of his uh, work is, of course, as being a member of the Nation of Islam, is to uh, promote the ideas and proselytize Islam. So when you have concepts such as Afrocentricity, which heavily critiques not only its own, uh, but especially Eurocentric and Arab-centric traditions, problematic for especially an organization whose very name the nation of islam uh exists you know saying to promote are with other groups this idea of islam and so what he has essentially done in which islam has done since the beginning is wage war on afrocentricity so the the title of this you know an african center critique is very 
very appropriate. And um, the the notion, like the the essence of an Afrocentric critique, is actually going to be more apparent the the closer we get to the end of the presentation. So, <laughs> in order for us to get started, we must define concepts first. And so, um, I'm going to define here Afrocentricity and Africology, you know, which is a discipline. So Afrocentricity is a paradigm based on the idea that African people should reassert a sense of agency in order to achieve sanity. The Afrocentric paradigm is a revolutionary shift in thinking proposed as a constructual adjustment to black disorientation and lack of agency. Africology is the study of the concepts, issues, and behaviors with particular bases in the African world, diasporan and continental. In other words, it is the Afrocentric study of African people. And so since we're talking about ancient Kemet, geographically and linguistically and culturally African, and as I mentioned in the beginning, which belongs to the China into uh, language and cultural family, in order to assess anything dealing with ancient Kemet, we, we can only do it from an African center point of view. So we look at it first and foremost from an Egyptian point of view, and then we look to its closest relatives linguistically and culturally to look for family resemblances and to see how that family and cultural, um, these cultural resemblances aid us in understanding obscure conceptualizations that we find in ancient Kemet, uh, known today as Egypt, of how ancient it is. And we, we no longer, for the most part, the, the ancient Egyptians as the ancient Egyptians practicing, you know, the culture as has been uh, fossilized in the, the pyramids, you know, and papyri and things that, in that nature. So an, Afro, an Afrocentric, an Afro, African-centered, uh, analysis is, is critical for getting to the heart of the culture. And so um, when we're talking about an Afrocentric method, the Afrocentric method considers that no phenomenon can be apprehended adequately without locating it first, studied and analyzed in relationship to psychological time and space. It must always be located, investigate the complex interrelationships of science and art, design and execution, creation and maintenance, generation and tradition, and other areas bypassed by theory. I won't read all of the, the, the points, but I'll just you know highlight them here so you can pause when I go through stuff that I'm just not gonna read. And um, we can you know say continue there, but, but for this slide I'll read. So the Afrocentric method is a form of cultural criticism that examines etymological uses of words and terms in order to know the source of an author's location. This allows us to intersect ideas with actions and actions with ideas on the basis of what is pejorative and ineffective and what is creative and transformative at the political and economic levels. In other words, linguistics, sociolinguistics, historical comparative linguistics are tools, major tools that the African-centered researcher utilizes in their work to not only analyze you know, ancient and modern text, but to analyze even the position of the author who is on African phenomena. So I, I don't want y'all to, I want y'all to understand that you know, my use of linguistics in pretty much all of, all of my works is part of the Afrocentric method you know, uh, within the field, the discipline. Remember that Africology is a discipline. And so you can go to Temple University right now and other universities and get a degree, a PhD in Africology. It is a, it is a social and scientific discipline. And so we have methods and procedures and linguistics is one of the tools that we use within the field of Africology. So I hope this makes sense. And so I'll just leave that there and then y'all can pause, but I won't read through it. Same thing here. You can pause again if you want to read it. 
but I'm gonna continue on. So now <clears throat> I'm just gonna give a few, you know, critiques of, you know, Raz Allah. Again, the bulk of my critique is gonna be formally written. And so um, to address that in of itself on a, on a PowerPoint and presentation, again, it, it, is, it is too much. And so um, I'll just highlight a few things and then jump into the Ma'adic Islam. So in summary, you know, what, what I found after reading the text is that basically the book is just full of bad, 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 bad methodology and sloppy linguistics. It is full of logical fallacies and misrepresentations of source material. Um, although Muhammad claims it to be 200 pages of straight ether, you have had to watch this Facebook Live presentation uh, way back in August, I think, um, to get that that line. So he claims that the 200 pages of Raz Allah uh, ethered me, and that's why I have not responded to him formally, uh, which is far from the case. Um, <laughs> And so it fails to demonstrate using the comparative method any of its claims. It's full of lookership. That, that's what the, the term we use. Um, or in other words, the, the mass comparative method, you know, look, um, proposed by Greenberg. And so, um, and so ultimately I say that he should be more humble when dealing with scholarship. Uh, so, you know, again, to, to make a claim that it is 200 pages of straight ether and that he ethered me, you would expect that it would be a, a scientific response, which it was not. And so he says a whole bunch, he, he quotes a lot of people, but demonstrates absolutely, there's not one page of demonstration in the entire text. And so I'm, I'm, I'm highly disappointed at it, but we will continue. So a few uh, preliminary errors in Muhammad. And so uh, Muhammad 2017. So one, not accounting the latest arguments. <clears throat> For those who are unfamiliar, uh, I wrote two texts, 13, that, uh, that have been published. And one is called, Where is the Love? How Language Can Reorient Us Back to Love's Purpose. And actually, this was, this, the ebook was released a few months after I released Aluja Volume 3. I mean, excuse me, Aluja Volume One, and so within that text, I just made a, I expanded it a little bit, and made it and and put it in book form and released it in 2015. But the text was actually released in 2013, the same year that Aluja was written, and so in here you updated position of Ra and the, the linguistics associated with it, um, because I as I as I show in the book. Uh, the word Ra and the word Ma'at are born from the same uh, linguistic root. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, and then there's my other text, Nesubiti, King in Ancient Egyptian, The Lesson in Paradigm and Leadership. Uh, again, I, I discuss and, and, and label what Ra is um, and its relationship again to Ma'at in these two texts. And so for him not to include and have read, or at least have included these texts in his uh, 2017 work, you know, um, is, is mind boggling. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. So that's my first critique because he would have to juxtapose his argument against my argument on what the meaning of Ra is and where it comes from linguistically. And I give a preview of that because I'm actually writing another entire book dedicated to Ra and Ma'at. And so I have to interrupt that to write Aluja Volume 2. And then after Aluja Volume 2, you know, I continue with the, the book of Ra. Number two, misrepresentations of my arguments. So in <clears throat> this... Uh, uh, you know, he, he's really good at this, uh, misrepresenting people's arguments. Um, not only from, you know, as it regards me, but looking at the source material in a few of his texts, he misrepresents his source materials. So in my text, Raz Allah, 
I make the following statement that Muhammad utilizes a lot of space in Black Arabia to highlight the blackness of not only pre-Islamic Allah, but a Ra of Egypt and the Sumerian An Anki in the form of black bulls, quotations. We noted before that another variation of the word Ra in Egyptian is Wur. And we can see here again that the ancient Egyptians associated Ra with bulls because of the similarity of their names when verbalized. Then I go through some demonstrations, but all of this is under a heading, Ra, Allah, and blackness in, in the text. And so, um, Muhammad continues to quote me, you know, uh, here saying where I say the blackness of the bulls in ancient Motis is symbolic and is associated with rain clouds. Although Muhammad 2009-86 cites Julian Baldick's black God, the Afro-Asiatic roots of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim religions, he didn't discuss Baldick's premise as to why Blackness is associated with the gods of Afro-Asiatic speakers. Simply put, the gods are black to represent black rain clouds. Muhammad notes some critical observations of the Oromo, but does this in passing. So at this point, Muhammad makes the argument that I didn't read his text thoroughly. And, and he cites, he, he continues to recite in his text where he wrote, uh, where he's citing you know, Baldick's um, work regarding the black bulls and their association with rain. <clears throat> and it's kind of confusing here. And, you know, I had someone else critiquing and they say, yeah, it's kind of confusing here. It makes it seem as if I didn't um, read the text, but I wonder how much of that is true when just a little bit after this, I give my premise and what exactly what I mean. And so Wesley Muhammad doesn't even cite this. He takes this out and only quotes what I have quoted thus far. And so just after what you just saw now, um, I say the color act is used to symbolize fertility, whether in terms of women giving birth to children, economic prosperity in one's life, or rain coming from the sky to nurture the earth. And then I have highlighted here, it has no racial connotations in African spiritual systems, as it seems to be suggested in Muhammad 2009. In other words, what I've been talking about in, in this section of the text of Aluja uh, Volume 1 is that uh, the, the argument I'm uh, making against Muhammad is that he's trying to bring 21st century racial connotations into uh, ancient ancient Egyptian conceptualizations in deities around the world. They didn't have any conceptualization of race the way that we do now. And they didn't operate as such. Thus, when you're talking about these quote unquote black gods, for example, when you see Isis or you see Osar or men, uh, for example, in the depictions of, uh, of them in, you know, in, in papyri or in statues as pure pitch black, to do with our notion of race it's symbolic and the bringing forth and the growth of things and so this is what the whole sex chapter was talking about and i make this clear it has no racial connotations in african spiritual systems as it seems to be suggested in 2009 so how he missed this i have no idea so in his 2017 work he may seem like I'm misrepresenting him who is misrepresenting me. And so this is stuff like this. Unfamiliarity with linguistic and phonetic principles. This is the main thing here. So we who have um, Dr. Wesley Muhammad's work, you will know that his argument, as I stated earlier, is that Ra and Allah are linguistic cognates. And that what I didn't mention, he adds, is that the, the variant Allah or L or whatnot, the proto-Semitic L, is actually retains the more, the, the older variation in that the 
version of Ra that we see in ancient Kemet is in fact a, a modification from a primordial representation or pronunciation where the L sound as in Larry or La or Lemon, so to speak, was rotorized, a process of rotorization and became an R, and, you know, more so a rhetoric R, like when you say Rosa or Rouge in, um, so to speak, for the word red. Um, so that was his argument. And so he then goes on in the last chapter or so talking about this primordial L and that he is of the belief that the L sound, and I, and I should go back, um, he argues that the L is, is the monosyllabic root of the word Allah and in L and Elu in Semitic. And so this L has been L since you know, the beginning of human language. And so he cites a study that was just unscientific as I don't know what. No, no comparative method at all. No establishment of sound laws, nothing. And so he, he takes that, it appears to um, support his thesis and in turn runs with it. And so he seems to be unfamiliar with the notion that you can basically through the process of evolution and sound consonant over time to morph into another consonant, even vowels. So you can get L from anywhere. So he didn't, because he didn't do any work, he can't tell us if the L was due of um, that has always been there or, or did it arrive as a result of sound mutation. And so what I wanted to do is give an example here of where the R sound, for example, could come from or even L. So anyone who, who deals with phonology in historical comparative linguistics knows that you can get R sound, the R sound or L sound from a number of different consonants. And so this one here is taken from Dr. Theofalo Obinga's 1993 work that I mentioned earlier. And I'll just translate it. English, uh, the common origin of Coptic, uh, you know, in, uh, in the languages, in the modern language, in the black, modern black African languages. And so the origin, the common origin of ancient Egyptian and the Coptic in the black African languages. An introduction to, uh, what is this, the historical, African historical linguistics. And so he's examining a, a number of terms and he's he's reconstructing the 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 words here and he's showing that we have to given the analysis that he did beforehand we would have to reconstruct um, and this original pre-dialectical t which we see up here which i'm circling with my mouse hopefully you can see it in the other languages in which he examined we see reflex of this t sounds and variations that we see here. So to our left, we see T has remained T in some languages. So T, the T sound by itself, and T, T-I, T, two. <clears throat> in other languages, the T becomes a T-S sound. These are simultaneous articulations with um, particular uh, different vowels behind it. So it's, tss, it's more like a T sound, so T, C. She, su, sue. And then in other languages, other African languages for which the term, and these are words for tree, by example. So all of these words here are words for tree in the, the African languages in which um, he has examined. So you see now the T has turned into the S sound. So S, C, se, su. But this T also turns into R. R, re, re, ru. But T also turns into L, li, le, la, lo, lo. So we can get R or L from T. And the next slide comes from another text called Historical Linguistics and the Comparative Study of African Languages, page 29. 
in, in this text, he's showing how the R sound can come from S or Z in the different states. And so he's, he's showing a few terms here that we would have to construct or reconstruct uh, this word here, meaning to rub, or with these other words, would an, an S sound, the sibilant sound S, as the first consonant in the series. And see here, in these proto nilotic these are nilotic languages, you know, not languages you find mainly in like Uganda, Sudan, Kenya. Um, you know, so we can see how this word su, this proto reconstruction su, morphs into rudo, rub. But in this other amongst the Pakut, the southern nilots, a uh, Pakut is a sub branch of the collagen people, they still um, remain with the S in the initial position. So it's su t. So you see how the sound change? So we see another one here, sock. But in shiluk, it is rock, stop up, stuff, cracks with rags. But again, amongst the pakut, they retain the older variation. And so I mentioned something in, um, in Eluja volume one regarding directionality. And so given these words here, we know that is it's highly unlikely that we have a change R to S. So we have to reconstruct the S in the initial position because we know that S normally goes to R. But the whole point of this, and you can pause and read this for yourself, is that <coughs> um, we can get the R sound from S. And so this is important when we're talking about Ra in ancient Kemet. So if we know that we can get Ra for example, from T or S, for example, why would um, Wesley Muhammad automatically assume that we get Ra from La or Allah, that it's a rotorization of a primordial L? This is why you have to demonstrate, using the historical comparative method, the sound change. Because otherwise, you just have a hypothesis, you're just guessing. And so the whole text is Muhammad guessing. <clears throat> Four, unfamiliarity with scientific principles as applied to linguistics. So this actually feeds into um, what uh, we, we just mentioned earlier. So here I say the scientific knowledge, uh, and I, I want to understand, I want y'all to understand that, you know, in, in the upcoming work, um, I'm going to be approaching this from, from the scientific perspective. And so I'm going to give a whole breakdown of the, the, the scientific method and then how the scientific method is applied in linguistics and then we're going to get into the the crux of you know the argument first with the demonstration and then commentary and theory formation but for those who are, uh, are not familiar with uh, how science works scientific knowledge and understanding accumulate from the interplay of observation and explanation Scientists gather information by observing the natural world and conducting experiments. They then propose how the systems being studied behave in general, basing their explanations on the data provided through their experiments and other observations. They test their explanations by conducting additional observations and experiments under different conditions. Other scientists confirm the observations independently and carry out additional studies that may lead to more sophisticated explanations and predictions about future observations and experiments. In these ways, scientists continually arrive at more accurate and more comprehensive explanations of particular aspects of nature. So as mentioned, the, the scientific method, observation, then you develop a hypothesis, then you test, you modify your hypotheses, you do it over and over again until uh, you, you have enough facts that you can form a theory. <clears throat> and so Wesley Muhammad stops at the hypothesis stage and just automatically goes to theory. No predictions, no test whatsoever. He has an observation where he believes that Allah and Ra sound alike so they must uh be descended from a common ancestor and then um so he hypothesized that they are descended from each other but he does no he makes no predictions and he he, he does no test 
whatsoever. He just goes straight to theory formation, which is Ra is a lie. Again, why Sar Motep is wrong. So we're showing why Wesley Muhammad is actually wrong because he didn't do the work. And so this is, a, it, this is not surprising to me at all from someone in the nation of Islam regarding a, a topic such as this. Why? <clears throat> For example, while I was in Atlanta putting on a presentation, Dr. Wesley Muhammad was in Houston, my hometown, uh, putting on a presentation, dealing with his new book, the, the uh, drug use and its and and its uh, alleged role in the effeminization of black men. And so there was some controversy going on there to where uh, the, uh, Brother Deloitte Parker, who's head of the Shape Center, had to cancel his events because of vandalism and threats, you know, made uh, to the center regarding Wesley Muhammad's, you know, um, presence there and, and the subject matter. So that's another topic for another day. Um, but during that, um, he went to the mosque instead and put on the presentation regardless. And at the beginning of his presentation, he stated, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, no, he says directly that um, he was talking about the Minister Louis Farrakhan's recent speech in Washington, D.C., or press conference. And he talks about how basically Allah or you know Elijah, whoever, gives our brother um, Farrakhan a revelation. And then as a member of the research, Nation of Islam research team, he says that God gives him the revelation and then we go out and find the documentation. How science works. You know, because you already have an issue already in the methodology because now you more than likely the information in which you're going to present is going to be full of confirmation bias that means any and all of the information that you you think that you found that coincides with the quote unquote revelation you know you will totally ignore all of the the evidence which um puts into question you know your theory or your conclusion and so it's ironic that he says that because that is clearly what has happened in Raz Allah and his 2009 Black Arabia and the African origins of Islam. So, um, so I'm not surprised at what I found in the text at all. And so this is a, a, a funny cartoon, a meme, where it's comparing the, the creationist method to the scientific method. So on the left is the creationist method where it says, where you have a, a scientist and a young student saying, here are the facts. What conclusions can we draw? In other words, because we've done some tests, we come with a series of facts. So what can we conclude as a result of the facts? Versus a creationist or religious person, what facts can we find to support it? And so that's exactly what you know Wesley Muhammad said, basically in um, his, his comment regarding Farrakhan getting a revelation, um, those in the nation finding the documentation to support the quote unquote revelation. So that's what we call pseudoscience. And it explains the shortcomings in many of his arguments. <clears throat> so there's also in the Ra Ez Allah a, a chapter called Imhotep's Bantu problem. And Wesley Muhammad believes that me using the Bantu languages and the Bantu cultures are uh, somehow hindering my ability to analyze text in, um, in dealing with ancient Egypt or linguistics in general. So he is of the belief that, um, one, that the Bantu languages are young. And because the Bantu languages allegedly are young and far distantly geographically removed from ancient Kemet, that it is an error for me to use Bantu languages and, and things of that nature in my comparisons. And so in this section, you know, Imhotep's Bantu problem, I'll say for who? Me, 
because I understand the scientific method and I understand what's important in linguistics. So all that matters in historical comparative linguistics is your ability to establish sound laws. Without sound laws, you have nothing. It doesn't matter how distantly removed a, a culture is in time and space. If you can establish sound meaning correspondences that are regular and establish sound laws, you have anybody who, who is in opposition has to um, nullify and disqualify that scientific process. And so, <clears throat> um, it, it, it also behooves me when, when other researchers, especially, you know, European researchers have come to the same conclusions that us of the African school of Egyptology have come to a long time ago. And so I'm citing um, a noted Egyptologist by the name of uh, Serge Sonoran. I'm not pr pronouncing that right, probably. But you know he he was a, a world renowned Egyptologist. I think he died in like 1976, <clears throat> and he was present at the famous 1974 UNESCO uh, colloquium where Shekhanta Diop and Theophilo Wabinga challenged all of the well known positions and Egyptologists in the world at that time at this famous um, symposium on of ancient Kemet and uh, the peopling of uh, ancient Egypt. So in his text that was released earlier in 1956, the French version, the, the, the English version was released in 1978. He says, thus the revelations of Ogotameli or of Bantu philosophy turns out to contribute precious information which helps us to better understand certain aspects of Egyptian religious thought. But in this connection, there is little, if anything, we can expect from a reading of Plato. So wait a minute. He says, thus the revelations of Ogotameli, that means Dogon religious thought, or of Bantu philosophy. When we're reading Bantu philosophy, we see the same things that we see in ancient Kemet. And so he's he's proposing here that we learn more ancient Egypt by studying Bantu people, the ancient Greeks, who were their one of their closest and nearest neighbors, and who were contemporaries, you know, of the ancient Egyptians, and who wrote about the ancient Egyptians. So when we talk about a Bantu problem, a Bantu problem for who? For you know, his initial claims, that's for who. <clears throat> and to show you what I mean, so this is this is what we what what Bantu can do, you know, for us. So uh, and, and shout out to everyone who has you know contributed to the Go Get Em Fund. This is one of the books that I that I purchased with uh, the the donated funds. You know, this is called um, the Historical Reconstruction of Great Lakes Bantu Cultural Vocabulary, Etymologies and Distributions by Dr. David Lee. Sean Broom. And this text here is, is, is just etymologies and distributions of Great Lakes Bantu words. <clears throat> so what we see here on the on the right hand side are reconstructions, Bantu reconstructions of a few terms that is in the third column, the white column um, on, you know, from left to right, the third column. And, um, but what I have text is the ancient Egyptian uh, cognates or proposed cognates for these terms. And, and in the second column are my sources for these words, which you see here on the left-hand side. So we had the ancient Egyptian, which I call Chikam, um, the source for the ancient Egyptian words, the Chibantu or Great Lakes Bantu words, and then the sound correspondences on the right hand side. So this is one of the examples of what I mean um, about, you know, he doesn't do any demonstration. So when we when we're talking about when I say that demonstration beats conversation, this is what I mean. So we can see here um, 
from the comparisons. Normally, we don't do uh, comparisons between living languages and proto reconstructions because proto reconstructions don't exist. These are hypotheses or theories of of the primordial ancestral form of a word or the the modern descendant forms. But we utilize and we do comparisons like this to test our reconstructions, to see the validity of our reconstructions. So we have reconstructions, then we line our reconstructions and we, we compare them to languages that were not involved in our reconstructions to see where our reconstruction stand, to see the strength and the validity of them. So this is a, a second part of a process in historical comparative linguistics. So we can see here, for example, have we we in English pronounce it unk, but um, we see here that the the Bantu forces us to change our pronunciation um, to swear an oath, and in Chibantu hanga, promise vow. We have unk, captive, and then we have hanga, tie up, fix into, and then we have a variation unk belt or binding and belt, and so we can see the same semantic. And so for those who are familiar with the, the captive word for unk, we, we know that the determinative is a man tied up uh, with rope. And so uh, it all fits into that. And then we have ankwa, uh, stars. And then we have hanga, shine intensely of the sun. And so I show in this upcoming book, Aluja, that the words for sun and the words for stars from a verb meaning to shine. So that will all make better sense in the near future. So words for fire, words for sun, words for uh, stars come from a word meaning to shine, a verb meaning to shine. Anket, fire. And then we have, you know, sa'ank uh, with the S cause of the prefix, create a sculpture, sculpt. And then we have hanga in chibantu, create. And then we have anku, billy goat, small cattle. The, the, W suffix is a nominalizing suffix, is a nominalizing agent suffix. And so we have the verb form in, in Chibantu Hong to dedicate live beasts to spirits. So, you know, if anybody's familiar with uh, African spirituality, you know that we sacrifice goats and cattle uh, to our ancestors and the gods. These are the, these are the beasts that we use um, to dedicate to the spirits. And so what we see here in every single representation, this uh, representation of the, the, the so-called fricative here, uh, the pharyngealized fricative, and um, here we have, it corresponds to the glottal fricative and Chibantu, the H sound. And so these are the sound laws that we have established based on this table. And so the N in unk corresponds to the N in Chibantu, and the ch sound, which we transliterate as lowercase x, corresponds to g in, in, in a final position of, um, of, of, of Bantu in regards to this text here. So these are the sound laws. But notice that I put here that based on the work of Schronbrunn, the h sound here actually derives from a p sound in other uh, languages. This will actually have to be modified <clears throat> in light of some new evidence. But, you know, this is how we can test. So I decide to bypass Bantu and, and, and support that notion in uh, the Yoruba language. And so <clears throat> in the Yoruba language, we can see that the pharyngeal fricative that I mentioned earlier that is given by this sign here uh, that you find in the, the transliterations, uh, which was given by the arm glyph with the stroke under it, a single monosyllabic arm glyph. I argue that it's more so an aspirated velar sound, uh, sound, but we can tell that somewhere down the line, this sound was labialized, and this is how it became P in, in, in other attestations, because we, we find that this sound corresponds more with a K or ng nasalized velar sound to the comparisons that we do, especially with Bantu and other languages. So we can see here these words 
and I highlighted in red and um, I put it in between these two lines. So hopefully it's easier for you to see on your screen. And we can see that it corresponds to these words here in, in the Yoruba language. So this monosyllabic root here, house, region, side, corresponds to Ipo, place, room, situation. Opa, Opo, Po, Ofa, the P turns to F, shaft, spear. Ah, arm, hand. Apa, arm, department, side, wing. So this is right here. This is the, literally the translation of this, um, this hieroglyph here. So we see it here in the Yoruba language. And so uh, trace, track, apa, uh, or apa, mark, sign, trace, scare, ipa, track, way, course, portion, piece, apa, part, which means portion, you know, saying, or a piece of something, part of something. <clears throat> so we can see here that these are regular in Chikam and Yoruba. And so it supports what we saw previously, you know, with the with this argument here. So we, we understand that this can only be by way of a family relationship. Ankh is more than likely Panga or Hanga, historically speaking. And so the Bantu languages help us to get a better sense of the pronunciation of ancient Egyptian words. And then we can re, uh, we can support that, you know, with, with other African languages. And so I, I, I leave that in a little bit and to talk about the importance of the worldview and, and cosmology of African people. And because now we're going to get into the um, concept of a Ma'atic Islam. And so for those who are familiar, again, our brother Wesley um, attempts to combine ma, uh, ma, the concept of Ma'at and the religious tradition of Islam, primarily based on ritual. And so there, there's a few of his texts, you know, uh, one on God, you can even get Black Arabia, um, you know, and, he, and you can see some of these comparisons. <clears throat> um, and 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 the the, the so-called linkages of these two concepts, but this is where especially the African-centered, the Afrocentric method comes into play, because before you can make these comparisons, you have to take and understand these concepts from the perspective of the Africans themselves, and I argue that the Semites are not Africans. And we'll get into that later as well. <clears throat> so, you know, um, our, our good brother, Dr. Reverend Jeremiah Wright, introduced me to this book, uh, God in the Ghetto by Dr. William A. Jones Jr. And it's a very hard book to find. It is out of print. And so more than likely it's gonna be in some major library somewhere, but it's supposedly one copy left on Amazon is like 300 something bucks. You know how they uh, try to jack up the prices. But anyway, so um, he has put together uh, this, this phraseology here that is very, which I find to be true first and foremost, and really kind of speaks to uh, a method for analyzing, you know, the, the ontology and the psychology of a people. And so, you know, this text here, God in the Ghetto, informs us that you know one's theology how i see god determines one's anthropology how i see humans and one's anthropology then determines one's sociology how i order my society and i think this is very important because this is going to be very critical when discussing especially ma'at because as i discussed in illusion volume two ma'at is god and so when we're talking about God, we're gonna see that God in, amongst the Africans is totally different from God in, uh, as perceived by the uh, Abrahamic religious traditions. So if we have, if, if Dr. Augustus Jones, Dr. William Augustus Jones, is, his statement is correct, if we have two different conceptualizations of God, 
then the way that we see humans in our sociology are going to be totally different as well. We would expect the prediction is that, you know, um, our societies would, would play out differently and thus our religions would play out differently. <clears throat> so this idea is not uh, isolated and relegated to um, Professor Jones. And so um, in this text here, Writing African History, which is a methodological book on how to research and write African history, Daniel McCall in his article in, in the introduction, he says, Africanizing history must begin with a holistic attempt to understand the total worldview and cosmology of African peoples. For without looking at their oral history in the total context of their thought, we cannot understand the meaning that that history has for them and why they have preserved it. So when you look at their worldview and their cosmology, the cosmology is, is, is equivalent to the theology because in African traditions, for the most part, God is the cosmos. And we'll get into that a little later. So this is just a, another way of saying exactly, you know, what the previous slide said. So in order to understand African people, you have to start off with their cosmology. So I'm giving you all a method here on how to, to research African history and African cultures. First, start off with the cosmology and trying to understand that. And then we'll see how that cosmology plays out in the culture of the people. <clears throat> so when we're talking about Ma'at, to again, because I'm going to show why band was a problem, not for me, opposition for the usage of, of, of Bantu. So <clears throat> as I, I have a presentation where I, I, I bring a little bit of this out already that I did at the Shekanta Diop conference way back in 2016. Um, and so, but there's going to be a whole chapter in Aluja volume two that is dedicated to the etymology of Ma'at. And so you would think that by now, as much as Ma'at has been studied, that somebody would have done an adequate linguistic analysis of Ma'at. And I am the only person to have ever done it. And so it, that will be the first chapter. But the word which we're pronouncing is Ma'at, which is really something more along Meriguit or Merahit. Um, is the cognate for it in the Basa Bantu language is Mbak. <laughs> and there is a professor by the name of Pierre Omendigi. And this is him on the left here. He's a, a prominent linguist and Egyptologist. And so when you talk about the Shekanta Diops of the world, when you talk about the Theophilo Abingas, for those in the Francophone world, they know that Dr. Digi is in that camp. He's in. He's of that caliber. So when when we talk about the African school, I am a student of Diop, Obinga, and Digi, Salam, you know, um, and things of that nature. So in um, he wrote a chapter in a journal uh, called um, I'll just read it in English: Egyptian Maat and and Basa Mbak. Notes for a comparative study of the fundamental constitution or uh, of two African civilizations. And there was another text written by a Michael Eon, Ma, um, Egyptian Ma'at and Basa Mbak, a, a small comparison of two regulatory principles of the cosmos. <clears throat> and in both of these texts, they equate the word Ma'at with Mbak but they don't do this based on linguistics, just on the concept itself. And so when they're looking at Mbak in their own Basa language and their own culture, they're like, hey, wait a minute, this is exactly as what we find in ancient Kemet with Ma'at. And so these two texts explore their commonalities. And me knowing what I know, what I know, um, I know that for the most part, the older generation didn't have the proper phonology 
for these two consonants in the word ma'at. So that's why we pronounce it ma'at instead of this being a nasalized uvular trill and this being either a velar consonant or a voiceless plosive like we saw earlier with the P sound. And so, you know, it, it, it gets confusing, you know, when, when looking, but this is how you know, as we'll show earlier, if someone has done the comparative method because sounds change and pronunciations change, but only by doing the comparison, the comparative method, are we able to uh, find the true cognates in the African languages. And so this is a step that, of course, Muhammad did not make. <clears throat> and so the root of Mbak is Bak. Um, this, this word Bak has several meanings, you know, gathering, leveling, sift, or even develop or establish. The universe, time, stand, container, the laws of nature. So, you know, for those who are familiar with my eye, you can automatically see where I'm probably going with this. Because for those of us who know about Ma'at, we know that Ma'at is defined as every one of these things here. And so remember what I said, the universe or the cosmos is God. So when we talk about Mbach, Mbach is God. We're talking about the laws of nations, we're talking about the universe itself. <coughs> so again, when we're doing these types of comparisons, we have to establish the sound laws. We have to, um uh make the comparisons and make sure that you know what it is that we're witnessing isn't a chance coincidence and so i'm just going to leave this for a second i'm going to go through this i'm not going to go through all of these you can pause this and and view it yourself <clears throat> but i'm going to take three of these items from the from the chart that you just said and, and go them. so hopefully you can better see the correspondences um here now so we can see the so-called word ma'at and the root of ma'at I have highlighted in red so that you can see the correspondences in the Basa language. And so as I stated in uh, where is the love and Nesubiti, the word ma'at prefixed. And technically this right here is a suffix um, as well with the root being L <coughs> um, or the R sound, the nasalized vula trill sound. And so in this case, the, the ultimate root would be B, with this being a suffix and this being a prefix. But it's fossilized now, so it's a, um, a consonant vowel consonant root in Basa. So, and we see the same thing in, in Egyptian as well. So, you know, we know that it is a word for rope, and then we have Ma'at, known as the unifying principle that holds all of creation together. And then we have Ma put together or to tie. And this is a source that you can find that definition. And so in Bach, you know, we have this concept of gathering unity. And then in Binga, we have a variation of the velar sounds that are dialectical in the Basa language, talking about the whole and entire. And we have Ma'at, level, balance. And then we have Bach, leveling. We have, you know, Ma'u, if we want to say that, which is really Merku or Merque, wind, breeze, Ma to sail. And we have in book when so we we have the b this is actually an implosive b here um but in other dialects it just be a b so they're allophones of each other um but we have the b corresponding with the nasalized of or trill we have the m corresponding with the m and we have e the k corresponding with uh the pharyngealized uh fricative sign for that um, but which is really a velar sound, which I mentioned earlier. And so we'll see that this NG here, this is actually one sound in Basa, um, is, is also a variation, you know, of this, that velar sound. <clears throat> so to give you some more sound correspondences, because we can't just, you know, make up stuff when we do our work. Hold on, I'm taking a sip of some hibiscus tea in my Ninja Turtles. Um, tea cup here, I mean my coffee cup here. Anyway, um, so we have ma, true, just, correct. We we have mbasa, imbo, mboji, because that K and that G interchange dialectically. Um, so some you'll see mbak, and some you will see mbag. They're the same word. So what is right, what is just. So M corresponds with M, 
nasalize the Vular trill, B, uh, K sound, G. My truth. Now, remember that I, I told you that that nasal velar, that nasalized velar, um, is one sound. And we can see here that the syllables are inverse. So this is ngamba, ngamba, genuine, real, true, inverse. Pay attention to this. It's going to be important later. <clears throat> I treat this, you know, saying as an inverse based on other um, other rules and stuff that I've seen earlier uh, that, I, that I work out in the in the book. And so we can see, again, the sound correspondences. So my truth, and then we have my lega truth. This corresponds with L. And we say that L, this corresponds with B and L in Basa language. And so when we look at the word sail and sail on, or fabric and linen, we see here the, the, the reverse of this. So remember, you see the reverse here, Imba, and then, and then the NG in the front. So now we see the syllables inversed again for the word for fabric, linen, or shade, you know, curtain, sail, or whatnot. So in Buangai. And so this is what I mean, that the syllables are inversed. And you'll see this more often than not. And so that's why I put this here. And so just to show you that this, the Malega, um, you know, truth, that the L also corresponds. I'll give another example here for the word for water. So water of the sky. Here's the source in Morrison book, uh, book two, page 25. And then Malak, rainwater collected from the roof. Again, here are the sound correspondences. My rightly orderly management truth justice embagi justice my place my village embag embag the land village the universe and so we've established and I, and I actually give a lot more so i i like to i like to do overkill so nobody can make arguments saying that i i didn't use enough examples book there's plenty more of these examples <clears throat> so as you can see here that we've established the sound laws and that they are regular and that you know imbag is the cognate for ma in egyptian so we can speak of imbak or imbag and ma'at is one and the same and so this is milana karanga dr milana karanga on the right his second phd dissertation was on ma'at in ancient egypt and this culminated into his book that was released in 2016 at least a paperback 2014 was the hardcover um, the Ma, the moral ideal in ancient Egypt, a study in classical African uh, cl classical African ethics. <clears throat> so he says, indeed, Ma'at is not only the shared essence of God, humans, and nature, but a binding agent also. For the ancient Egyptian Ma'at, as the order of creation, bound all things together in a indestructible unity. So remember that word imbag meaning unity uh, and related to the tying and rope that I mentioned earlier. So you can go back to that slide to see what I mean. Therefore, the universe, the natural world, the state and the individual are all seen as parts of a wider order generated by my eye. It was as argued above, the organizing quality of phenomena that ran through and united all things. As stated above, Ma'at was the essence of existence, which was not only the essence of the creator and humans, but also of the natural world. So this word essence here means to exist, the substance of existence. Ma'at is existence itself. And if anybody has ever heard me, you know, discuss God in the African context, I keep saying that among Shiena and two speakers, God is existence. God is the essence of existence. It is existence itself. And so you see here that Milana Karanga is, is reinforcing this fact, but he doesn't equate Ma'at with God. He's reaffirming, you know, uh, this research that I've done, talking about God being existence itself. So Ma'at is just another word for God itself. <clears throat> and so when, when I talk about God being existence, being the essence of creation, being the universe itself, I'm gonna give a few sources. And I'm going to start with the Amazulu because Dr. Wesley Muhammad likes to, likes to quote the Amazulu when he makes his assertion that God is a man. So if you anybody familiar with the Nation of Islam is familiar with their stance that God is a man. And they, they debate, 
you know, other Muslims about this question, where they, Wesley Mahan attempted to bring that idiot to Africa. It's because Africans depict in their artwork, God is a man. He is of the belief that God is an actual man, literally. And so we're going to find out using the Zulu, which he quotes, but who he doesn't know. So part of my method is only as much as possible scholar are initiated into the systems and talk about their culture, who grew up in the traditions. It, you'll find that their work is totally different than what an anthropologist from the outside coming in studying for a number of months or a couple of years writes about any particular tradition. So this is Kreta Mutua, Busu Muzulu Kreta Mutua, an Amazulu of South Africa. He is a shaman. In 1954, he wrote this book called Indaba My Children, or Gather My Children, African Folk Tales. So this book is a, is a collection of oral traditional stories of not only the Amazulu, but of Bantu speakers all across Central and East Africa. Because Kredo Mutua is actually initiated in a number of African systems, uh, stretching from uh, Central and East Africa down to South Africa. So these are their combined stories. <clears throat> so now, about God, there's a small, there's, there's a chapter where he, he stops the storytelling and giving you the myths and he starts talking about his, his own initiation into being a shaman. So, so right now he's getting ready to introduce us to his teachers and what they taught him during initiation. So now comes up the discussion of God amongst the, um, the Amazulu. So he says, it is said that the Bantu have no conception of a universal single God, that in their religion, they worship the spirits of their long dead ancestors. They are superstitious and fetish ridden and tremble when, they're gra when the thunder growls. The world has been shown images carved by the Bantu. And this would appear to be the sum total of the knowledge foreigners have gained about our religion. The Bantu believe in the existence of God, but their concept of God is different from that of other races. While we believe in a heaven, our concept of heaven is totally different from that held by other races. The Bantu version of hell is an evil land. But in this land, we see no devil with tail, horns, and forked tongue uh, tormenting the souls of the wicked in eternal fire. Now, this they actually agree with. They have commonality with the nation of Islam. <clears throat> so now we fast forward to the, the part where he is um, he is being introduced to the wisdom of his tradition by his, his elder teacher. So now he's being initiated. So now one of the elders are talking to him. So now he's talking, now Kreta Mutua is talking in the elder's voice. So he says, the, and this is the elder speaking to Kreta Mutua, my child, you know from the teachings of your parents that every child is taught that there is a great God and that there are also the lesser gods, but you do not know just what the great God, whom we shall call the most ultimate God is. And this you are about to be told this day. The most ultimate God, who is the God of the gods of the gods, is everything and everything, everything in everything. Each tree, each blade of grass, and each stone that you see out there, and each one of the things that live, be they men or beast, are all parts of God. Just as each one of their hairs on your head and each flea in your hair, your blood is part of you. The sun is part of God. The moon is part of God. And each one of these stars is but an infinitesimal part of him who is and yet is not. Him who it was and yet was not and him who will be and yet shall never be, because there never was a time when God was not and ever, and there never is a time when God will never be. So as Professor James Smalls would always say, God is everything and all things at once. 
And this is what Credo Mutar reaffirms here. And so everything is God. And so, you know, we can already see here that there's a problem with trying to argue that God is a man when, when the Amazulu are saying that God is everything, existence itself. Continue. And this is the elder continue to speak. My child, God is more in you and, and is more part of you than you are in and a part of yourself. He exists in you more than you exist in yourself. You were not created by God as the aliens tell you. So we, we but you exist as part of God. So this is a fundamental difference. And you, you see my highlight in pen because uh, I took pictures off, off of the book, the book I got instead of retyping all of this. Your soul is immortal because God is immortal. And your soul and mine are as much a part of God as the grain of sandstone is part of the boulder that is part of a child. I want you now to look at this ball of clay. This ball of clay is known as the ball of instruction and was first used generations ago by the great ones of the mother nation known as the Batu from whom we all sprang to instruct those whose duty was to carry the flaming crescent of our beliefs onto posterity. This ball has another ball inside it. And that one has still another smaller ball inside it. There are seven balls within each other here where you only see the outer ball. And this, my child, is the ball that symbolizes all our knowledge and our beliefs, that everything under the sun is part of something greater still. This ball, my son, is our symbol of infinity. As an infinite being here. He says, you will want to know what God looks like and how he would be interpreted by your eyes and your brain, you, you, where, you, uh, where you to see him. But my child, other than that we know he exists for the very reason that we ourselves exist, we do not know for sure and we must never sure. No man can ever see God and live, un live or understand what he has seen for God is such that his very essence his very being and his very shape will be beyond the interpretation of the human eye and the human brain. God is a mystery God, you know, according to uh, the Bantu speakers. But, you know, the Nation of Islam don't believe in no mystery God. So this is going to be important to our discussion. So just keep that in mind. So the elder continues. We can only guess, and the oldest guess at the possible form of God is the one that you must go and touch in the land of the Swazi when your hair begins to turn gray according to the law that binds all of the chosen ones. The, the other one is, the, is in the land of the Botswana and you must never let death close your eyes before you touch with your hands both these symbols of eternity. Carved in Mbiti wood, which is a sacred wood that can only be used in the carving of very holy things and images. Both these carvings show God has as shaped like a great canoe with a human head at the stern and a human head at the prow. These heads are both looking up into the heavens, which is a sign that God continues into infinity and has neither end nor beginning. Riding in the canoe is an image of a woman, which symbolizes the great mother, the ultimate feminine creative cause of all and a symbol of the bisexuality of the most ultimate God. The body of the canoe stands on the back of a carved wooden crocodile without a tail, and this shows that God is neither good nor, uh, is neither evil nor good, neither life nor death, neither merciful nor cruel. God exists, but as far as we know, for no reason whatsoever. God is neither beneficial to us nor interested in us in any way. As you can see already, God is a different conceptualization as he stated in the beginning and what we see in the Abrahamic traditions. <clears throat> and so this is the image that is shown on page 50, 563. So all of this is like 561 going into 563 as far as this discussion is, is concerned, going into 564 action. So just because you see, you know, wooden carvings of gods and stuff like that, they're actually text and they're teaching you concepts that this is not what they praise. This is not God. This is a representation to describe certain characteristics of God that, you know, saying he rules and looks and goes into um, the future and goes into the past, infinity in both ways, and that he is neither good nor evil, the crocodile, and that he, uh, 
there's a feminine mother or principle, the creative agent of this thing that we call God. And so, you know, we again, we can see that this has nothing, this is nothing like what we see in the nation of Islam, their conceptualization of what God is. Because if you're talking about Ma'atic Islam, you got to understand that Ma'at is God. And this is what we're talking about as far as God is concerned. So <clears throat> I'm going to continue. So the elders continues. All these carved concepts, because he named some more, that wasn't the only one he described. All these carved concepts of the form of God are only a means of satisfying the common rabble with which cannot be made to worship any God unless that God has a shape that they can more or less understand and hold in their mind. I hope y'all understand that. So we only we only make these uh, these concepts of you know God being a man or a woman or a crocodile or a wooden boat because there are some people who are not intellectually mature to understand God in the abstract. So they need something to to focus on. So they have an idea of what it is they're talking about, you know, until they mature into uh, something that can grasp the 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 higher concepts of what god is so they are also intended to discourage young people from asking too many questions and you O oh chosen one meaning you the initiate must only bear this in the valleys of your mind that god is there and the lesser gods are there but no one can ever know what their forms are a god must never be interpreted as having a fixed shape god can assume any shape he desires in whatever form would suit him his purpose best as any given time. There may be times when lesser gods can assume the shapes of animals or trees or even rocks or boulders, but the, re but the reason why the lesser gods more often take human forms is because we would understand them better when they communicate with us. <clears throat> so th that's the end of the instructor teaching. So now we're creating Mutuah's coming back. My instructor proceeded to explain that while these masks and carvings serve their purpose to instruct children and the common people. I, as a chosen one, as a priest, as an initiate, about our actual concept of God. I cannot repeat his actual words as it would occupy far too much space. And he explained everything in a symbolism which many of my readers would fail to comprehend. Briefly, he compared the universe with a gigantic anthill. The structure as a whole is God, and as us and everything we see about us is merely the ants and the sand grains inside the anthill. So more representation showing that the universe is God. God is existence. And so they have all different types of ways of demonstrating that. And this latter part of this conversation is that, you know, this stuff is for children. So when you talk about Nkulu Nkulu as a word for God, and they show him and depict him as a man, that's for a child in elementary, middle school, high school. Not for an initiate, not for an intellectually mature person. So this whole concept of God being a man, and even if you find that in Africa, that's for babies, that's baby talk. You know, the adults understand God as the universe, God as existence itself. And this is exactly what is said here. So. <clears throat> to show that this isn't a fluke and that, you know, this isn't just one source, because I have many of sources, especially with the Amazulu. This is a, a text called Conflict of Mind by the late Jordan Ngobani. In 1979, he, he published this text, and this is him on the right-hand side. He's also an initiate into Amazulu lore and priesthood. And so he gives... Uh, insight into the the zulu tradition and the zulu conceptualization of god in this text and another text that he's written so now in the text uh, uh conflict of minds <coughs> he says the following hold on while i take a sip the zulus coupled the ancient aphorism amuntu ingamuntu halahawa Ever, and I probably messed that all up. Akalahau, Akalawa. Any of my Zulu speakers, y'all can correct me on that. So, Muntu Akalawa. The person is never so evil that he is beyond redemption. The Zulu speaking nomarchies of antiquity believed that all things had their origin in Ukobo. 
Ukobo is, is one of the names for God. And Ukobo is going to be important because Ukobo is cognate with the word Ma'at. Everything in the cosmic order evolved from Ukobo. So we're talking about evolution here, not creation. It's evolutions. Everything in the cosmic order evolved from Ukobo. This Ukobo was primordial consciousness. It had no beginning and no end. It, it was the infinite total of the values of all things which together made the cosmic order. This brother here is reinforcing what uh, Credo Mutua said earlier, that God is everything and all things at once, and that it is an infinite um, universe, the cosmic order. Um, that they're using here. <clears throat> Ukobo was forever forming clusters of itself and combining these to produce phenomena. The agmination, the word agmanate means cluster. So the clusterization was regulated by Mthetha Wemvelo. We translate this into ancient Egyptian. This would be the word, the combination of the word medu keper. And so this is a different variation of the word saying medu netcher. And I'll get into that in the, the, the publication of Ra. That's going to be different. But this is basically the agmination was regulated by medu netcher. But they say medu keper. But we can show that keper and, and netcher are variations of the same word. The law of appearing. So that's what mtetho means law and wemvelo means appearing or to appear, to create. Since Ukobo, the consciousness, was alive and there was no death in it, since it was an infinity, human behavior in all its forms on every plane and all in situations translated the law into action. Nothing on the earth or in the cosmic order could violate the law. For the violation was itself an expression of the law. So even here, we would be in opposition to Islam. Because Islam and Christianity and Judaism swear that it's possible for you to break God's law. In China into, it's impossible to break God's law. So it's possible to break God's law in Abrahamic traditions, but it's impossible to break God's law in the China into speakers. So this is on page 79 here. So the word ukobo, u is a prefix. Kobo is a word for fact, reality, truth, essence. Remember that Ma'at is the essence, the truth, the fact of reality. Ukobo, actuality, absolutely, certainty, definitely, indeed, really, truly. Remember, Ma'at means truth. Ukobo, loi, his or her very self. Lukobo, actual, real, substantial. It's the substance, it's existence. That's what all of this means too. When something is real, that means exist. And this is existence, this is the truth, this is the substance of all things that is formed. And so we have on the right here, another Basa language, I mean the, the, the language in Basa, Imbo and Boji, what is right, what is just. And remember that term I said, the symbols were switched? Genuine, real, true, inverse. In, in Amazumu is Ukobo. And so Mbak, 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 the universe. All of these are variations of the same word. But it's, it's culminated here in Ukobo. So when we're talking about Ma'at, we're talking about the Amazulus, we're talking about Ukobo, we're talking about Mbak, Mbak. We're talking about existence. So remember the phrase from, um, from Dr. Jones. Your theology informs your... Uh, your anthropology, so your theology, how you see God, informs your anthropology, how you see humans. Your anthropology then informs your sociology, how one organizes one's society. So when you're talking about the Chiena into speakers and their conceptualizations of God, this is what you have to understand. Not the childish stuff that we give the babies that God is a man walking around somewhere. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we have 
you know, when I said that, uh, you know, again, the Nation of Islam likes to throw out there that we don't believe in no spook God. We don't believe in no mystery God. Then can knows for a fact that this is what they say. They, they every, every meeting that they go to, this is what they argue. But this is one of the reasons why you cannot combine, you know, Egyptian conceptualizations with Islamic. Because, is, I mean, excuse me, the ancient Egyptians, just like the, the Amazulu, they believe in a mystery God. And the Egyptians tell you. So we're going to talk about Amun Ra since we're talking about Ra. I mean, remember that Ra, in, uh, uh, according to my analysis, is a variation on the word Ma'at. <coughs> So this is uh, what I'm citing here. The transliteration is on the left. So those who want to check it um, is the hymn to Amun Ra, chapter 200 of the Laden Papyrus. So it says, unique is Amun, who keeps himself concealed from them, who hides himself from the gods. No one knowing his nature. He is more distant than the sky. He is deeper than the duat, the under ancestral world. None of the gods know his true form revealed in the writings. No one has complete testimony concerning him. He is too mysterious for his prestigious majesty to be discovered. Notice the word used there. He is too mysterious for his prestigious majesty to be discovered. He is too great to be questioned, too powerful to be known. One would drop dead instantly from fright one calling out his secret name knowingly or unknowingly. There is no God able to invoke him by it, his name. Hidden by our hidden spirit is his name. So mysterious is he. So God is so mysterious that they had to mention the word mystery twice in this hymn to, to Amin Ra. And the reason why it's a mystery is because God is an infinity and God is existence. You can never step out of infinity to observe what God is. You can only uh, deductively understand what it is from the inside because you can never be on the outside and look at God objectively. God has no shape. Infinity has no shape. Although there are shapes within, there's movement within the infinity. So if you don't understand this about African religion, this is what puts everything I just read here is what I just read in the other uh, Bantu traditions, which is which reinforces Professor Sonaran's notion that, you know, we learn more about ancient Egypt through the Dogon and Bantu philosophy than we do other groups. <laughs> and so remember what I said earlier, your theology informs your Anthropology and your anthropology informs your sociology, how one organizes one society. And you can see the difference in how in the, in the social makeup of the Chiana Intu speakers versus the uh, Abrahamic religions and people who believe in God as a separate entity from creation itself. And so we, we, we note these types of things as uh, hierarchy versus hierarchy. So we put Islam in the hierarchy category and Ma'at in the hierarchy category. So we notice that in the hierarchy, there's this one entity and then it's above and flows, you know, saying above in terms of value, um, above other entities, which are above other entities. But that's not the case with Ma'at and Mbog and Mbak and Ukobo because God is existence and everything is God. That means it's a hierarchy. Everything is interconnected in our aspects of God. So there is no hierarchy because they all share the same value. They're all God, which is why when you look at the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, you notice that damn near everything has a nature or God determinative at the end. Every concept could be considered a God in ancient Egypt because they follow this milieu. They, are, they have a hierarchical. And so we see why there's a more egalitarian society, even though there was political hierarchy in ancient Kemet and in other African societies. <laughs> and so this is just a graphical representation of this. And so um, 
we noticed uh, there's a concept I'm going to kind of really introduce into the, the, the conscious community called the, uh, the great chain of being. And the great chain of being is built basically from this notion of hierarchy. And so when it comes to value, there's a hierarchy of, of, of things from which the societies are then organized by. So um, in, in Hamlet, so to speak, uh, at the time of Shakespeare or whatnot, the great chain of being was introduced like this. So you had at the top is God, then you had the angels, then you have human beings, then you have animals, then you have vegetation, then you have minerals. So minerals are quote unquote the lowest form of being. And God is the highest form of being for the most part in China into with the exception of one group I think at least that I know of and so within that human group you have a different hierarchy so you have the kings princes nobles and then man and that's a literal man because under that usually is woman and so man is ahead of the woman and you know like in the Bible the husband is the head of the woman the woman the head of the children and, and um, Jesus or God is the head of man. So that's the hierarchy in terms of value. And so this is something that you don't find too much in traditional Africa, a hierarchy in their conceptualization of God is what we see here. It's more egalitarian, but they do have political hierarchy, you know, and it's usually based on age, the elders, so to speak. <laughs> but um, and so this becomes important because the of this under the humans, the animals. And so what what groups who under the great chain of being, if they believe that you are not of them, then they put you in the animal category as something less than human. They dehumanize you. And this is what um, this is the the impetus for a lot of the discrimination racism, uh, the jihads, and things that we see coming from these religious traditions, uh, you know, over the years. And so for those who are familiar, I'm also working on a book called Religious Proselytization as a Form of Violence, the Infringement of the African Concept of Simultaneous Validity. So these books that I'm working on, I'm building you up for that text, ultimately. Because there's, there's a lot of things that you have to know and cover that it would just be too much to include in that one book. <clears throat> so, you know, keep that in mind. So, so it's not a, it's not a, it's not a surprise when you read stuff like this. Surely the vilest of animals, creatures that are lost sight are those who disbelieve and they will not believe. And so when it comes to animals, we're equated to animals and creatures if we don't believe in Islam, if we don't believe in Allah. And so when, when the Arabs enslave you, it's because they see you as less than human. Only a human is, is one who follows Islam. Everybody else are bestial animals. And so that's why, you know, when once someone views you as an animal, it is a, it's marching orders for your murder and your destruction. And this is what you got to keep in mind. So all this that we're discussing and we're debating, it's not small. It's not trivial. It has greater implications. And so these are some of the greater implications in which I'm talking about. So it, it makes sense when, for example, like uh, our good brother Nuri Muhammad in a, a YouTube video that you can see, uh, which is labeled, the link is right there at the bottom under the picture, which I snapshot that picture. <laughs> called the FOI Swagger. And so a young man asked the panelists, which you can kind of see part of the panel right there, you know, how can we make our Islam, you know, how can we do our Islam in school without being corny? So that's what the 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 the, the younger brother asked the panel for them to respond to. So our brother Nuri Muhammad um, gets up and he gives his explanation. But within that explanation, he says the following. He says, there is no friends for the Muslims except Allah, the messenger, 
and the true believers. The rest of the Negroes is just your associates. So you gotta understand that if you're not Muslim, you're not in Islam, you are not their friends. And Wesley, not uh, Wesley, Dr. John Henry Clark has warned us time and time again, as an African, you have no friends. And so this uniting, trying to make it seem like we are of the same tradition and you know we could coincide and they're on equal phase on equal footing is not that's not the case and, and we have to be careful so we got to start thinking more like a nation and so we can work together we can be in alliance but we got to understand that as a nation you have no friends you only have shared interest and so if we was to unite with the nation of islam it would only be with the shared interest to get rid of european white supremacy after that, we make our, our we depart our separate ways, because they will never look at you as equals. You will be animals to them, and you are not their friends. You Negroes to them, <laughs> and so again, I reinforce it, it. It's understandable why, you know, people in the tradition of of, of Islam and the Nation of Islam specifically, and more specifically, our brother Dr. Wesley Muhammad, when he says our children are being kidnapped by ideologies other than Islam gangs, Afrocentricity, or the so-called culture of hip hop. We're losing our children to all of these ideologies. And so, you know, this is why we gotta be precise. This is why Afrocentricity and African-centered um, approach to understanding the world and African people is a problem for Islam. Because it brings out things that Islam would like to push under the rug. <laughs> and so, um, you know, in my analysis, I actually should have put this slide earlier. Uh, I show that, you know, um, that the real cognate for Allah in, uh, in African traditions, here's just a few. There's another variation. I told you uh, Ma'at is one. And we also have another variation of Sekhmet. Sekhmet is a variation of the word rock. And amongst the Yoruba, the uh, uh, deity and name and everything is uh, o, uh, our elder Ogun. You know, these are variations of the same root. And I show linguistically, based on sound laws, that this is the fact. So this is the, this is the, the kinds of revelations that you will see when you actually do the work. You know, I go through all of this because I want to um, highlight that you know, Islam just isn't our thing. So much, um, pay, so much ink has been spilled on trying to make the argument that the Arabs and the Hebrews were black people. And that's just simply not the case. And there's, there's several different factors that we have to consider and, and, and why, you know, that, that contribute to why their systems are just so drastically different even though they have a few of our concepts, but the overall systems are different than what you find on the continent of Africa. <clears throat> and so, you know, these are the Semitic languages. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we have here um, Ugaritic, for example, Iblayet, Aramaic, Amorite, Phoenician, Ammonite, Hebrew, Moabite, Edomite, Nabatean. Ancient North Arabic, Arabic, Philistine, um, which you don't see here is the Ethio-Semitic languages and the South or you know, Arabian languages, you know, or whatnot. Um, but because the map is really kind of vertical, but I really want y'all to pay attention to this area here. This is the what we call the Levant. Mesopotamia is pretty much up here. And um, so this is the real birthplace of the Semitic languages. There have been many proposals to Semitic in Africa, but there is absolutely not one shred of evidence that that is in case the fact. That it, that it in fact is the case, I should say. There is no, there's not one surviving indigenous Semitic language that one could even speculate that it originates there. But because they are so um, hell bent on this uh, Afro, Afro Asiatic hypothesis, you know, they they speculate a, a Semitic origin in Africa. 
and that the Semites traveled into um, the Levant, you know, um, in, in ancient times. And so we come to find out that that is, is not the case. And so that used to be the belief of Dr. Christopher Eric. But in a 2009 paper um, <coughs> by Andrew Kitchen, Christopher Eric, Shafira Asefa, and Connie J. Mulligan, titled Basian Phylogenetic Analysis of Semitic Languages Identifies an Enhanced Age Origin of Semitic in the Near East. So they're arguing that the Semitic languages were, were born in the Levant area, you know, where uh, Canaan, Lebanon, you know, uh, Ibla, those areas. Um, and, and around 5,750 years ago. So somewhere close to 3,700 uh, BCE in the Levant. <clears throat> and so this is the map from the the paper and so what he's saying what they're saying here is is exactly what theophila wabenga had been saying since the 70s that the semitic is not an african-born language group and that they borrowed heavily from african languages which jean-claude and Boley was able to bring out even more in his uh uh, the Origin of African Languages book in French um, that was released in 2010. And so I discussed this in Nesubiti and in Where is the Love? So both of those texts, I discuss what I'm discussing now. And I'm going to go even deeper in Eluja volume two. So here's the map here where the, around where the origin, the proposed origin is. And so Aramaic, Hebrew, all of these and the, the Semitic language disperses from there. So you have East Semitic where you get the Akkadian languages, for example, and then you have West Semitic, which breaks down to the West and Central Semitic. And then, you know, these Semitic travel down to Yemen, crossed over into Ethiopia and became Tigra, Gaez, Tigrinya, Amharic, Agarba, um, Gafat, Sodo, Garaj, Harari, you know, these languages here. So, and this explains also why there's such a large admixture genetically of, you know, um, Arabians who migrated, you know, over a course of a few thousand years, who kept going back and forth into the Horn of Africa. And so those light-skinned Africans that you see over there are the result of intermixture. Um, but that's a whole different discussion, um, but, you know, otherwise, but still related to uh, African history and related to this particular topic. So this is what you see here. And you can read this on, on your own on the right here. Um, <clears throat> and so what I argued in the 2015 Where is the Love book, here's one of the maps that I use, that the Semitic languages is a result, it's basically a mixed language. It's a pidgin language that evolved into a parent language, which then had children, you know, or daughter languages over time. And that is really a mix of probably three main different groups. You know, the, the Negro, Egyptian, or Chiena Intuskers, native folks from this area, and those who black migrated from India. So this is a genetic map done by National Geographic. And, and it's about the out of Africa route, you know. And here we can see that the origins of man in East Africa here and then the based on the genetic data going through southern you know where yemen is southern arabia and then crossing over into the india subcontinent and then you know into the furthest of sub indian continent spreading out into russia spreading out into japan you know and uh, southeast asia cambodia vietnam all of those and then ultimately to australia but there was a group of those indians that you know, stopped right here near Gujarati and migrated in, in two different dispersals. So it's one group that migrated back, migrated towards Africa, became your North Africans, your Berbers, your Moroccans, and, um, and your Asians, your Asiatics right here. And so um, there's another ones that became your quote unquote white people. 
And so um, this is what the genetic map tells us today. These folks who are quote unquote indigenous to here were not black folks. And we'll see that um, here. And so in an interview in 2012, it says in the interview that the early Semites were just a few Africans arriving in the Levant to find a lot of other people already in the area. So he was still of this belief that basically the proto proto Semites were Africans who just ended up in the Levant and um, but their language, quote unquote, naturally evolved into Semitic. But this seems to contradict his statement here. So what happened to all the other people that were already in the area? Who were those people? Relationship between those people and how did those indigenous languages, quote, Semites, they uh, moved there and settled there due to the formation of the language in that area? Linguistics that we call convergence. And this is when different language groups in a similar, in a, in a shared geographical space over the time of a few thousand years, their languages begin to converge and, and uh, their shapes begin to merge to where it appears as if it's this one language. This is what we believe is the beginning of language families. One of the things that, you know, uh, not only some other Semiticists, Semiticists have discussed, but Jean-Claude Mboli independently has discussed based on his work. <laughs> Same thing that Theofalo Obinga argued, that these languages are not African languages. And this is something I used to believe when, you know, I, I thought that, you know, Afro-Asiatic was, was a valid construct. But now when I look at the evidence, I see that this is not the case. And so, you know, this idea, this concept of convergence, there's, uh, this is kind of what we mean by when, when we talk about convergence. So this map or this, this graph here, you know, these, these letters are to represent, you know, um, either languages or more so in reality, language features, you know, some from, from some different languages, so to speak. So we have here in stage one, for example, this is what we call the river Delta scenario. <clears throat> so if you ever seen a river Delta, um, you know, you see that it kind of moves out in a V type fashion. So there's one river that turns into many, you know, saying or many rivers that converge into one river. So this is what we see here. So we have many rivers converging into one river here at the top. And we see one river converging into many rivers. But these are all just to represent features, topological features, genetic features, whatever, shared vocabulary, you know, uh, phoneme sounds. And when, when they get to the point where they converge, like we see here on E, or we see here in H and uh, L, or, you know, say in M, you would have to treat these, if these were to represent languages, you would have to treat these as different families because they're receiving different features from different languages. And you cannot logically reconstruct to a single parent all of these features, which we find in these in this one language family. So this is what happens in, in Semitic. So Semitic is an outgrowth of a, a convergence process between African language speakers and, you know, non-African language speakers. <clears throat> and so again, this is the, the African map as proposed by Obinga in his 1993 work. And so in his Negro Egyptian, which I renamed China into, he says it's basically three language families in Africa, Berber, Negro Egyptian, and Khoisan, whereas Greenberg argues for Afrasian or Afroasiatic, Nilo-Saharan, Niger-Cartophonian, or Khoisan. None of these language families on this right-hand side have any scientific backing whatsoever. If you supply that scientific method to any of these labels or many of these hypotheses, they would all fail. Many uh, researchers have pointed this out, not only the following. And so <clears throat> this is important because we want to talk about this term called Amu, who were these, these shepherds, these Semites in Asia who interacted with the ancient Egyptians. Now, 
these were, you know, despite a despised group of, of Asiatics um, to the Egyptians. And we note that in the Bible, and this is partly where you get some of your Hebrews from. Um, they were also known as Haparu or Aparu in um, the Egyptian lore. Um, but we can see here in Genesis 46, 34, all shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. They just loathe them because of the, the character of these people in, in terms of these nomadic herdsmen, which includes your Arabs, which includes your Bedouins, which includes your Hebrews and other groups. They share a type of culture which just hates because all robbing and stealing, murdering this nature, because they live lawlessly. Exactly how Hebrew culture was birthed, how Arabic culture was birthed. It's the, the Egyptians despised these groups, collectively called them the I, these are the people who we would call your Amorites, but it, it included more than what you would genetic call Amorites because it included everyone in like um, Lebanon, Syria, you know, places like that. So, you know, these are the variations of this word here. And um, I'm, I'm doing a separate paper arguing that this is where you get the word harem. But that's another topic for another day. To give you an idea of how the Egyptians viewed these Asiatics, we take one example coming from the 10th dynasty, is during the first intermediate period, uh, from the instructions of Mary Carre. They say, Lo, the miserable Asiatic, he is wretched because of the place he is in, because he lives in the desert, short of water. Of course, they're going to be short of water because they live in the desert. Bare of wood. Of course, there's no forest in the desert. His paths are many and painful because of mountains. He does not dwell in one place because they're nomads. Food propels his legs. Hunger propels him. Uh, trying to eat because they don't, they don't have access to adequate food. He fights since the time of Horus. That means they're constantly at war. And that's one of the things that we know about these people in the Middle East. They stay at war but not conquering nor being conquered, like a thief who darts about a group. So this is what the ancient Egyptians are, are um, talking about in terms of these Semites. When you see these Amu or Asiatics, so to speak, <laughs> these are what they look like. There is no such thing as a quote unquote black Hebrew. You may have had black people who are part of the culture, but that's not them. These are people who adopted, just like people can adopt Christianity now, can adopt um, Islam. But uh, these are people who were brought in to the cultures, or some of them could have just been uh, slaves, you know, in terms of Africans. <clears throat> but when you look at these Asiatics, this is a wall, uh, a wall towel depicting an Asian captive kingdom. This is Dynasty 20, 1200. 1085 BCE. This is important because, um, hold on one second. Um, this is important because, you know, they try to make it seem like the quote unquote white Jews or white Arabs more recently in history adopted Christianity, Judaism, or, or Islam, and somehow these traditions became white. But people keep forgetting that the ancient Egyptians have been depicting the Asiatics, the Semitic speakers, and have been interacting with them since pre-dynastic times. So for a period of 3,000 or more years, the ancient Egyptians have been consistently drawing the Semites. So when people start talking about that the Hebrews are black, that the Semites are black, that the Arabs are black, how come they never give you consistently over this time period pictures of these quote unquote black Hebrews or black Semites because they don't exist. And so when we see these pictures here, we see that they, the people who are in the Middle East now are the same people who were in the Middle East during for the Pharaonic period. And these are the creator of Islam, of, of Judaism, etc. And we, we had African pockets who was absorbed into these groups. 
And so we have more depictions of these Amu, these Habarus. This is a block relief depicting a battle, possibly a reign of Amenhotep II. This is Dynasty 18 in Upper Egypt and Thebes, 1427 to 1400 BCE. This is way before Islam. So the, Amite, the Amorites include Arabs and Bedouins. And you see with the big beards, the, the long hair, this, and, and, and the skin color, these are the exact same people. The Egyptians were consistent with this. So I'm, I'm actually going backwards. So you saw that in the 20th dynasty, this is the 18th dynasty. <clears throat> this is a new kingdom, I forgot what period. But you can find this um, of an Asiatic. Look at this, this is a painting. So I'm giving you primary sources. I'm not giving you reconstructions. So nobody can say, and I'm trying to um, use not wall carvings or stone carvings where there is no paint because anybody can make it seem like these are just light-skinned black folks. And that's just not the case. So this is a Nubian and Asiatic prisoner. The Nubian. And so we look here, they look just like the Semites, which you see in the area now. No different. And so here's the famous, this is in the Middle Kingdom of, of the Semites coming in. And you know, the Hebrew Israelites want to make it seem like these are black folks. These are not black folks. And so here's the, the depiction of the women. Tomb painting depicting the Syrian. These are Syrian Amorites, women, migrants, 12th dynasty. Kunim Hotep, these are Semitic speakers. And so have you ever seen an Arab woman or a Jewish woman, a Palestinian woman? They all look like this. They don't look any different. Here is a, 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 a Semitic man, and, and, and I have a circle around here. It's going to be hard to see. So if y'all can find this photo, this is from the tomb of Kanum Hotep II, the Bini Hassan, Dynasty 12, you can see fringes on the side of the garment here. This is the 12th Dynasty. Keep this in mind. <clears throat> and this is the Hekahasu. This is the Hyksos. But these are Amorites, Semitic speakers. Specifically, these aren't Europeans, none of that. These are these are Semites. And we see the skin color, we see their skin tone, we see their 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 uh beards, we see their hair tone, their hair color. These are not black Semites. <laughs> so in Numbers 15, 37 through 40, we have this 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 command for those, you know, everybody knows they used to be a Hebrew Israelite, so we know about this unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue it is shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye use to go a whoring that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto, uh, holy unto your almighty. So when you see the Hebrew Israelites on the corner in New York and Jersey and Philly and other places, and you see them with the fringes, that's why we wore the fringes. Because we were commanded. But we see here before there's a quote unquote Hebrew Israelite in the Bible that they're already wearing the fringes. These light, pale-faced, Semites. That's their culture. And so when you talk about Job and his, his robe of many colors, you see that. That's the culture of these folks. Not no black Hebrews. The real Hebrews. <clears throat> and so some more depictions, you know, um, and you see the fringes of these uh, Asiatics. You have two Nubian, two different Nubian groups here, and then you have these Asiatics. Notice the skin tone, the hair, the, the quintessential beard. This is a towel, you know, uh, going back. I don't know if y'all can see this because this is, uh, you know, painting from the wall and the, this, the wall is chipping. But this is from the, um, <coughs> I think this is the Middle Kingdom as well. This is uh, another Asiatic. This looked like one of the quote unquote, uh, and I'm using quote unquote on purpose, terrorist 
You know, if, if you was to see him, you would think this dude's an Arab terrorist. They look exactly the same as they do. Uh, they, di uh, they did the same. So here's another. There's a bunch of tiles here. These are primary sources. The Syrian, you know, the Hittite, Hittites are actually the Europeans. But the Haparu, the Shesu, same folks. And so we have to keep this in mind. Like this is going back all the way to the time of Narmer. So when Narmer, quote unquote, united the um, the the upper and lower Kemet after going to war in the north, that's because the Semites have have been encouraging the Delta since pre-dynastic times. And so they came in invading. And so the the start of Pharaonic Egypt is the gathering of the troops fighting off the Asiatics. And if you could get a, a picture of the Narmer palette, pay attention especially to this image right here that I have my, my mouth circulating. Because you see that quintessential nose. They even, it was the detail to get that, that Jewish nose down packed. And you see their beard and, you know, saying the straight hair which he has in his hand here bundled. It is even more clear these Asiatics. They'll try to argue, well, these were black Asiatics. There's not no black Asiatics. These were the, the Asiatics we kept sawing, you know, from the new kingdom all the way to the old kingdom. And so here's the king of the Haparu, you know, uh, a dreamer of Alalaka or Alalach. This, uh, this is in the British Museum. If any of y'all go to the British Museum, you can see this. <coughs> Excuse me one second. And so this does not look like no black Semite. But you know, given that to the stone, they'll be like, well, he could have some black features because there's no paint. But that's why we look at the painted stuff first. This is a Haparu. And the Haparu is really a mixed breed. You may have some black folks in the Haparu. You may, uh, you, you would definitely, because it's a coalition of Semitic speakers and some other people, but they all were nomadic pastoralists. Um, create a confederation and became the quote unquote Hebrews who settled in Canaan and, and, and over time the dialect of Southern Canaan became the Hebrew language. But this is one of those Haparu. This is, these are not black, these are not light skinned blacks. They may have some black features because of some early mixture that goes into it. But we would not consider these folks who you see in Palestine and Israel and Arabia right now, black folks. And so this is more so what the Egyptians, the real Egyptians look like. So this is Amenhotep III. So these are actual wall depictions, still rich in color. So you see that Afro, you see the difference in the hairstyles. But you can see that African people wore beards too, just like you see this, um, this is a professor who teaches in Toronto um, at York University, I think it's in Toronto. But he's in Canada, definitely. But he's a Eritrean, Eritrean. You know, so you still, you, you, it's these type of brothers, you know, that you would see often. But this is Amenhotep III. But this is uh, the raw depiction here is still some kind of fragments. It's kind of broken. But you can still kind of see it on the wall when you go there. You still see the Bantu people holding on to a lot of the culture here. So just saying all that to say, on and on. But I'll end there <clears throat> that the, the Semites, again, are, are not by any stretch of the imagination. And this whole concept of a Ma'atic Islam, a basis, is incompatible. You know, just because you have some, some, that, appear to be similar that they are a shared tradition the cosmology you have to go into the theology and so that is what separates groups so i'm two minutes over my two hour mark and so i don't see any questions so far in the chat at least was uh, it looks like here and so my chat seems to be skipping over posts every now and then, so I'm, I'm not sure. 
um, this out, you know, saying too long. And, and so I don't want any of those, those long, because uh, I think this is a lot to go through. So, you know, this is what I discussed. I, had to, I didn't get to go through all of it, you know, for reasons we can discuss at another time. I'm just scratching the surface. So the real, real stuff in terms of the book or the, the upcoming book, uh, um, it's coming, you know, so, um, and even if possible, if we can have a, you know, uh, getting into this discussion. So I appreciate everyone who is live and we have at this moment. So listening, I appreciate uh, y'all who held it down and listened for this long. I'm not sure if I'm engaging enough for two and a half hours. I to condense it as much as possible. So if y'all have any questions, hit me up on Facebook, comment section, you know, and listening, God night.